today we are just going to work um, together one in-class assignment problem uh, so I can demonstrate both nodal and mesh analysis in the frequency domain. Uh, then we are going to use MathCAD to solve these systems that we're going to set up. And then for the second in-class assignment problem, I'm going to leave you guys to your own devices. And if you need any help with either the circuit analysis or the MathCAD, uh, please let me know. All right. So this circuit right here, um, we are analyzing it and we are asked specifically to use mesh analysis to determine the current IX of T. Uh, so we're going to do that first. We can very obviously see that this circuit is in the time domain because all our voltages and current signals up there uh, are functions of time. So very obviously, or at least I hope it's very obvious, the first thing that we need to do is to convert this circuit from the frequency, or excuse me, from the time domain into the frequency domain. So let's start just like we did in our uh, class last Tuesday. Uh, by converting our voltages and currents first. Okay. So for our source voltage, Vs of T is equal to 12 cosine 2000 T plus 60 degrees. Uh, what is that going to look like as a phaser? So this is this guy right here. Well, 12 angle 60. Yep, nothing remotely fancy about that one. Okay, and now let's take a look at this current. So IS is 200 sine 2000 T plus 90 degrees milliamps. How might we represent that as a phaser? 200 angle zero milliamps, right? So the reason why it's angle zero is because that's a sine function and we need to switch it to a cosine in order to develop our phaser. We do that by simply subtracting 90 degrees from the phase angle. I'm going to choose to represent 200 milliamps as 0 0.2 amps. So this is going to look like 0 0.2 angle 0 degrees amps. Are we all okay with that, going from milliamps to amps? Okay. So we have our sources taken care of. Now we need to change um, our inductors, capacitors, and uh, resistors, as it were, into their equivalent impedances. Let me go ahead and do this as well. We'll call this phaser current IX and phaser voltage VY right here. So what's the equation for the impedance of an inductor? Uh, J yes. Times your so, two pi times the frequency if we were given linear frequency. What are we given linear frequency? Oh, smart. Okay. So you mean... J omega L. J omega L. Where omega is? Negative. Okay. Omega is never going to be a negative number. Let's... What should be your. your um... We're looking for IX. This would be IXT, which would be 200 or 200 No. Omega is just this guy right Omega here. Like, Always just the like, thing that's multiplied by time inside that cosine or sine function, right? So for our inductors, we're going to have J omega L. So that should be 2000 times 4 times 10 to the minus 3 is J8 uh, for this guy up here. And my six millihenry inductor, uh, I'm not going to use the J omega L relationship here because six is one and a half times four millihenries. My impedance would just be one and a half times larger, right? So one and a half times eight is 12.
now we have our capacitor. What's the expression for the impedance of a capacitor? Negative J divided by omega C, right? So one over 2000 times 80 uh, times, what's micro mean? 10 to the negative six, absolutely right. So this is gonna come out to be negative J Twenty-five over. So our circuit has been completely um, converted from the time domain into the frequency domain since our resistor just gets left alone. So now we are going to perform our mesh analysis. How familiar are you all with mesh analysis? Dabble. You did it. Okay. Yeah, but uh, well, it's the exact same thing here, okay? Um, except we're going to have phasor mesh currents instead of DC mesh currents. So I always choose to represent my mesh currents as flowing um, clockwise around their meshes. There's nothing that's requiring us to do that. That's just the habit that I developed over time, and so that's the way that I'm going to do it here. So, we don't have any dependent sources or anything like that to worry about. Do they deal with dependent sources in, so like voltage controlled current sources, current, current okay, so I will stop talking then. All right, we're not going to worry about any of that jazz. So, I'll need to make sure I don't give you guys anything like that on the homeworks or whatever. All right, so um, we're going to write a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation for each one of these meshes. I typically like to start at the bottom left-hand corner of each mesh and then just go around the mesh following that mesh current. So for this first expression where I'm writing KVL around... mesh one, the first thing that I see is the 12 angle 60 degrees voltage source. And I see the negative polarity terminal of that voltage source, which means my first term should be negative 12 angle 60 degrees volts. The next thing I see is my J8 ohm impedance. So I'm going to have J8 ohms, and then because we're doing Kirchhoff's voltage law, we need to convert that into a voltage by simply multiplying by the current that's flowing through that element, which is our mesh current I1. And then next we're going to see the negative J25 fourths of an ohm impedance. And because this element is shared between two meshes, we're gonna wind up having some combination of mesh currents here. So since we're following the mesh current I1 around its clockwise path, I1 is going to get a positive sign. And then I2 is actually flowing in the opposite direction as I1 when it goes through that capacitor. So we're gonna give it a negative sign. And then we simply set this equal to zero. And because I know for sure that we're going to be using a computer to solve this system, I'm just going to leave it exactly like this. I'm not going to do any simplifications or anything. I'm just going to leave it alone and let the computer handle all of that for me. So this is our first equation. Sure. Right. So if I were to give you a problem like this on your exam, all I could expect you to do would be to set up the equations correctly, okay. which I think is a reasonable thing to ask, not to necessarily solve them. That's significantly harder to do without the use of a computer. It's not impossible, but I don't know how much you guys know about or want to know about matrix manipulation and all of that kind of good growth stuff. 
I don't care for it either for what it's worth. Um, computers are great. So uh, any other questions about any of the terms in this equation or anything like that? So, I think it's just the thing. I remember remember we did mention stuff we had two voltage switches. Like so with the equations that followed, whether you understood or you just memorized, still set up that way. But mm -hmm. it's a meter double. Okay. So. All right. So <laughs> Did you guys learn about super meshes? Yeah. Okay. So let's let's see what happens here really quickly. And then we'll talk about how we can fix this. So I would encourage you guys to actually not write down what I'm about to do um, because it will intentionally have a little bit of an error in it. So I'm going to wind up erasing it and fixing that in a moment. So I'm going to try to write a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation around mesh two here. Okay. So starting from this bottom left-hand corner, just like I did before, the first thing that I see is my negative J25 over 4 ohm impedance. And now, since I'm following that mesh current I2, the first term I'm going to see is I2. Or excuse me, uh, I'm going to see I2 with a positive um, sign. And then I1 is flowing in the opposite direction. So it's going to get the negative sign here. You had your hand raised, Charlie? That's the plus of the voltage. I'm only treating a voltage source as if it were a voltage source. I'm just adding voltage drops because that's all Kirchhoff's voltage law is for, is saying the sum of the voltages around any closed path is equal to zero. So um, just to be clear here, when I write my KVL equation for mesh two, I should expect all of my I2s to be positive, And then any other currents I see are going to be opposite to I2 if I define all of my mesh currents in the same direction. Um, so that's why this I1 gets a negative sign. Effectively, just for the sake of argument here, this current I2, when it's flowing through the capacitor, is in the up direction as it goes around its loop. I1, as it goes around its loop, is in the opposite direction. And because currents in opposite directions need to have opposite signs. All right. So the next thing that I'm going to see is my J12 ohm impedance. It has a current of I2 flowing through it. And then the next thing that I would see as I follow I2 around its path is actually that 0 0.2 angle 0 degrees current source. Now, this is where things get a little bit wonky because that's an independent current source. And really what that means is that it supplies that amount of current regardless of what voltage drop occurs across it. Since we're applying Kirchhoff's voltage law, we are trying to figure out what that voltage drop is. And there's literally nothing about that element that will give us that information. So what we're going to have to do instead is actually skip it and go around, okay? So let me graphically describe what we did for the first problem or the, the first loop, right? We went around this path. For the second one, we're going to take this path. We are bypassing that current source because there's literally no way for us to figure out what the voltage drop across that current source is just by looking at it. Okay. So I'm going to change this from KVL at mesh two to KVL at super mesh. Two, three. 
And it's super mesh 2, 3, because that half effectively encloses mesh 2 and mesh 3 together, okay? We're only going to use this technique whenever we're trying to avoid a current source. So we get past the current source. What's the next thing we see as we go around that pink path? The 10 ohm resistor, okay? So plus 10 ohms. Now, what's the current flowing through the 10 ohm resistor? Which mesh current? I3. Right. So I think I heard somebody say I2. So this is getting busier and busier, but I2 is only flowing around this path right here. I3 is the one that flows through the 10 ohm resistor. So here's our second equation. And now we've ran out of Kirchhoff's voltage law equations that we could possibly write here. So we're gonna to have to think of another relationship that we could possibly use. And what we're gonna use is something related to that current source that we skipped over a moment ago, okay? So I'm gonna write this as a current relationship. And anytime we see a current source in a mesh analysis problem, we are going to have a current relationship. Oops, I put current source, not relationship. Okay, so that current source IS is in between mesh two and mesh three, or it's shared by mesh two and mesh three is another way to put it. So I'm gonna say that the current that's being supplied by my source, which was 0 0.2 angle zero degrees amps, is going to be equal to, and now I need to figure out how those mesh currents are related to. So which of those two mesh currents winds up flowing in the same direction as the current source when it goes through its clockwise path? Three, okay? So let's look at it really quickly here. So here's mesh current I3. It's going in the same direction. So it's going to get a positive sign. And then if we look here, when we follow mesh two around, it winds up going in the opposite direction. So it's going to get a negative sign. Oops, that should be I2. And there's our third relationship that we can use to solve this system for all of its mesh currents. So before we jump into MathCAD to solve this system, if you guys have any questions, please, please, please ask. Yes. I'm sorry, what was that? Uh-huh. It's 200 milliamps. Yeah, and so 200 milliamps is the same as 0.2 amps. Mm -hmm. Go away notification thing. There we go. No, 0 0.2 angle zero degrees is equal to I3 minus I2. So let me, yep. Any other questions about this setup here? Because it's fairly important that you guys are able to replicate this kind of analysis if you want to, you know, be able to do the homeworks, tests, etc. All right, so 
we have our system of equations. So now let's pop over to MathCAD. And set some things up. Okay. So let me move this thing out of the way. Because we're solving a system of equations, we are going to have to use the solve block, which I would guess you guys are all at least kind of familiar with. Okay. So at least a few of you are. Okay. You guys are arguably a little familiar with like programming languages and all of that kind of stuff. Okay, so I'm going to kind of approach this at least how we are setting things up like we were trying to set up a computer program. Okay, so here where it says guess values, this is effectively where we declare what our variables are. So for this system, our variables are the mesh currents I1, I2, and I3. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do capital I. Oops, I have caps lock on, so that didn't work. Um, you don't have to get fancy like I do and use subscripts and all of that kind of stuff, but I'm just going to have it as good practice. So to get the subscript, it's control underscore I1. So MathCAD has literally three different um, three different equal signs and they all have different meanings. We're going to see all of those show up here today. Okay, So the first equal sign that we're going to use is actually shift colon. Okay, So this is effectively saying the variable on the left hand side of this equal sign is going to have some value. Okay, and we are going to guess. I am going to guess one angle zero degrees. So I'm just saying arbitrarily, I think that current might be one amp. I'm probably wrong. I'm almost assuredly wrong, but I just need to give MathCAD somewhere to start figuring out how all this stuff works. Okay, so because we're dealing with a complex system or a system using complex numbers, I'm choosing my guess values to be complex numbers as well. Um, if we go here to the operators tab, or drop down menu or whatever you want to call it, and we come down here to engineering, we can see um, that this is where we get our angle symbol but it also has the keyboard shortcut of control shift P. So that's what I'm going to use because I am too lazy to go into that menu over and over and over again. Okay. So I have my one control shift P. Now I put my zero. If we go back into that operators menu and look next to the engineering uh, or the, the angle operator, we see this is where we get our degree symbol. Now, the degree symbol does not have a keyboard shortcut, which control shift U. That's the scaling thing. The one to the left of it, which is the degree symbol, does not. I know they look similar, but the degree symbol doesn't. But we can trick MathCAD into thinking effectively that it has units by just typing the letters DEG. So this is short for degrees and it will interpret that as the angle before it is in degrees. So this gets us around having to go to that stupid menu every time for degrees. So it's a little bit more clunky, but it's the same exact result. Okay. Now, I'm going to give this units of amps. And particularly when I'm dealing with complex numbers, MathCAD can be very, very finicky. So I'm going to explicitly multiply here by A for amps. And the reason why I'm doing this is because sometimes MathCAD interprets things that are in parentheses as functions when we don't want it to. Explicitly multiplying tells it, hey, this isn't a function, this is just a number. 
Okay. So that's why I have that multiplication times A there. I'm going to do the exact same thing for I2. And I3. So let me know when you guys are ready to move on from here. So we got a little bit of a problem in as much as this stuff isn't going to fall. And to get out of this bill, what's the way to get it? Okay, so it's locked because your license isn't set up correctly. The instructions for setting up the license are in that link um, that's available on the We can sort that out in a little bit. You know. Just call them those what? The, the special the equal sign, correct? Yeah, so shift colon for shift this particular colon. equal sign. I say this particular equal sign because in just a moment we're going to introduce another one. The that one's right. Yeah. It's effectively saying, I want to store one angle zero degrees as the variable I1. I'm sorry, what was that? Shift colon. Yes. Or the down line. From the test, do you have like record plus one for extra points? I don't currently. I could try to make things out a little bit, like just kind of reusing some problems from, yeah, and all that kind of good that stuff. Would be yeah. Um, I'm good. promising nothing. Let me let me start there. Um, because it depends on my time and my mental bandwidth, but I don't think that that's a bad idea or a bad use of my time. I just have to find that time to do it. Yeah. So I'm open to it, but I guarantee you nothing. All right. Um, are we good to move along-ish? Okay. So now I'm going to start entering in these equations that we developed. These are my constraint equations. So I'm going to put them in the constraint section of things. So I don't really have to go all the way down to here um, to, to do this. MathCAD will wind up fixing the size of those brackets to accommodate what I put in. So I'm just going to come right here. Uh, so the first term in my first equation was negative 12. Uh, ang oops, I hit control P, not control shift P. Angle zero degrees. 60, thank you. The other one was. This has units of volts. Then my next term, let me go back here, was J8 ohms. So much like in our calculators, we are going to have to put this in as 8J, okay? So 8J, notice right now that the J is not italicized, okay? If I were to put in the ohm symbol here, which I'll do it really quickly, uh, and I'll explain how I do it in a second, now it converted that to the J to italics. 
that is very much not what we want because it's effectively saying that there's some magic unit called a J ohm. Okay. So instead, after I do the 8J, I need to explicitly multiply by an ohm to tell it, hey, this has units of ohms. Okay. So let's talk about how to get that omega symbol easily. Now, if we go up into this symbol menu, we can see all of our lowercase letters in Greek, all of our uppercase letters in Greek. Notice um, that it's always something and then control G. Control G is literally just saying convert the last thing I typed into Greek effectively. So I know this is going to seem kind of dumb, but let me explain it here. Lowercase w, control G, gives us lowercase omega. So uppercase w, control G, gives us uppercase omega, which is the ohm sign. All right, so now um, we should have, I think it's just I1. Let me double check. Uh, Times capital W control G. Yes, so that's the that's our imaginary operator. So we're just leaving it there exactly like when we type it into our calculators or stuff like that. Uh, now I need to multiply this by the current I1. And then I have my third term. Well, my third term was negative J25 over four. So I'm gonna do negative 25 over four J. Negative 25 J over four ohms, so um, shift W control G times I one minus I two. And now we get to our second equal sign that we're going to use today. So this is control equals. Yes, trial. Is there a you didn't explicitly tell it to multiply. What do you mean by the invisible one? Like it's not. Like the thing right here, there's an unbubbled multiplication. If you don't explicitly put the whole thing, you don't have to put it in the whole So I think it's like the whole thing. So it's like the So just to reiterate, I got this bold face equal sign by pressing control equals. So this equal sign effectively says everything on the left hand side of the equal sign must equal everything on the right hand side of the equal sign. So this is why it's our constraint equations, right? It's forcing these relationships to be met when the system gets solved in the last step. Yes. Sorry, what? Control equals. So we have the shift colon equal sign for declaring things. And then we have the control equals equal sign for forcing relationships to be true. So before we move on to inputting our second of our three equations. Does anybody have any questions about this? Okay. Good deal. All right, so let's look at our second equation. So now we have that negative J 25 over four times I two minus I one. Um, so we can put that in really quickly, negative 25J over 4 ohms 
times I2 minus I1. Our second term here should be J12 ohms times I2. So 12 J oops, ohms times I2. And then 10 ohms times I3. And control equals to zero. I'll give you guys a moment to catch up. <laughs> oh, capital so now I can capital W. Don't have press that a word. Not control shift D, just control shift. <laughs> Type the capital W symbol first. Now press control G. <laughs> All right, have we got this second expression put in? All right, so let's go ahead and take care of the third equation here really quickly. Um, so our third equation, we have 0 0.2 angle 0 degrees amps is going to be control equal to I3 minus I2. So we should be able to do that relatively quickly. If I could type. And so now we have our three equations that we are trying to solve. Okay. So now we get to the final stage of this process, which is having the computer solve this thing for us. So I'm about to do something um, that's maybe a little odd, but it is a kind of best practice type thing. Uh, I'm going to put a matrix in here because I have three different variables. I'm going to make my matrix a three by one matrix. Okay. I'm just going to move this down a smidge. Three by one. If there are three variables, it's a three by one. If there's 10 variables, it's a 10 by one. So just make it like a right. column. Yeah. So go to the matrices slash tables tab. And then the leftmost drop down menu is for insert matrix. And then just select the three by one. So in this first field, I'm going to put I1. In this second field, I'm going to put I2. And in this third field, I'm going to put I3. I'm going to get outside of the matrix. And then I'm going to press Shift colon to give me that fancy equal sign that we used first. And then I'm going to type the word find open parentheses, I1, 
I2, I3. Oh. Oh. Oh, no. uh, you're, you're got outside of the parentheses right now, which is um, first back in the middle of that. First, the video file is green at the bottom. Yeah, that, that's totally fine. If it's green, it's just giving you a warning. If it's red, it's saying something broken. Give me just a second. Let me see what one broke. No, I'm good. I put the J in all stuff. Well, yeah. So yeah. So now we'll say I don't know what that J is. But it's okay. And then so the next one. So that's part of your even so. You don't have any different multiplies. What does this error do? We're gonna turn on the fast. You do not know who. All right, so are we all roughly right here? So now, now I'm going to use the last and final equal sign available to us, which is just a completely normal equal sign. And what it does is it spits out the numbers, okay? Now, it spit out the answers to this in rectangular form using I as the imaginary operator instead of J. That's crazy. I don't have the then you type something in. We'll find that in a minute. So, if we go to this math formatting tab up top, and then we click on this bottom right hand thing, um, we can choose how our complex numbers are expressed, okay? So this top option is rectangular form with complex numbers um, or using the I imaginary operator, then rectangular form with J as the imaginary operator, then polar form with the angle expressed in pi radians, polar form with the angle expressed in radians, and lastly, polar form with the angle expressed in degrees, which is the thing that we actually want. So I click on that and I get these three mesh currents, okay? So let me move this thing out of the way. So we got these three mesh currents. If we go back to our original circuit diagram, we weren't actually solving for any of these, those mesh currents. We were trying to solve for the current IX. 
So now that we know those three mesh currents, how do you think we might solve for that current IX? So it's going to be very similar to what we did for our current relationship equation, right? So IX is the current that's flowing down through the capacitor. Mesh current I1 flows down through the capacitor. Mesh current I2 uh, flows up through the capacitor. So IX must be I1 minus I2. So outside of our solve block, We could now say that the current I X is I one minus I two. We get that answer in rectangular form. Expressing it in polar, we get five point nine eight angle seventy seven point five two three, which matches what the answer that I have in the assignment sheet is. So let me, just one, one second, let me explain something here. So this matrix that I put here, the reason why I put the matrix here is because if I don't, none of the variables and stuff that I declare inside my solve block will actually exist outside the solve block. And I can prove this very easily. If I were to delete this bit, it still finds all those answers, but when I try to do any additional math with those variables, it doesn't know what they are because they only existed inside the solve block. That little matrix thing uh, well, damn it. Let me put that matrix back in. Exactly right. It's just like a global variable in a traditional programming language. So could you have done, could you have put I? You could. So you, we could have just introduced a fourth equation and all that kind of stuff if we wanted to, but I don't, I don't do it that way just because that's not even any real reason. I just don't do it that way. I do my solve block for just my mesh currents, and then I do all of my post-processing, if you will, outside of the solve block. All right, uh, you had your hand up a moment ago. Yeah. Sam, you had your hand up. All right. So we have worked part A. So um, I will save this sheet um, and upload it to Canvas for you guys to have as a reference kind of thing. I'll probably save it um, as both a MathCAD sheet and as a PDF, just in case you change stuff and can't get it back. Yes. They're coming out in rectangular and stuff. Are those in a math format? So, uh, that change that would be good. Yes. 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 Uh, 
Projector is just going to reset itself every day at around 8 .50. Okay. Oh, what the hell just happened? <laughs> All right, so we got the same result as the expected answer for part A, or at least we would if we converted back from the frequency domain into the time domain. Our magnitude's the same, our phase angle's the same, so we did things right. Trial of Whenever we go to the subatomic organ, we can call that as You don't have to. You could, but I'm not worried about that. Yes, ma'am. All right, so I'm going to clear all this stuff off, and then we're going to rework this problem to do part B, where we're doing nodal analysis. All right, so for, oops, uh, let me rewrite all of our phaser stuff. So this was 12 angle 60 degrees volts. This was 0 0.2 angle, 0 degrees amps. This was J8, J12, minus J25 fourths, IX, VY. All right, so nodal analysis, uh, we need to choose one of our nodes to be ground. We don't necessarily have to choose the bottom node, but that's usually a pretty good place to start with. So choosing my bottom node to be ground, I, need, uh, I now need to assign nodal voltages to use. So I'm going to call this nodal voltage V1, nodal voltage V2, nodal voltage V3. So Ron, did you talk about super nodes at all? Okay, great. So if we tried to apply Kirchhoff's current law at node one, we would run into an issue in as much as we would be trying to add this current 
and this current together, which shouldn't be problematic, except that the current flowing down is the current through a voltage source, and that's giving us effectively the same problem that we saw with the current source when we looked at mesh analysis. So instead of writing a Kirchhoff's current law expression at node one, what we're gonna have is a voltage relationship equation. So anytime we have a voltage source and we are applying nodal analysis, we are gonna have a voltage relationship equation, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to say this 12 angle 60 degrees volts is going to be equal to some combination of nodal voltages, okay? And how we figure that out is whatever voltage uh, nodal voltage is on the positive polarity terminal of the voltage source, which in this case would be, look at the picture, which nodal voltage is connected to the node for the positive source, or the positive polarity terminal of the source? B1, absolutely right. What is the nodal voltage at the negative polarity terminal? That's ground, and ground is always zero. So V1 minus zero is just V1. So anytime we're trying to define a voltage in terms of our nodal voltages, it's always going to be the nodal voltage at the positive polarity terminal minus the nodal voltage at the negative polarity terminal. Okay. So there's our first equation. For our second equation, we are just going to write a KCL expression at node two. So that is going to involve adding these three currents together and setting them equal to zero. So what's the current flowing to the left through the J8 ohm impedance going to look like. Effectively do it exactly like you would have done it for a resistor network that you've dealt with before, except instead of a resistor, you now have an impedance. All right, so let's talk our way through this. The current flowing to the left through the J8 ohm impedance is going to be V2 minus V1 over J8 ohms. So a handy way to remember this is always the node where the current starts minus the node the current flows to divided by the impedance. So it starts at two, flows towards one, divide by the impedance. So using that, what is the current flowing down through the capacitor going to look like? Zero, because it's flowing to ground, divided by negative J25 over 4. Absolutely right. And then what's the current flowing to the right through the J12 ohm impedance going to look like? V2 minus V3 over J12. Add all these guys up, set it equals zero. Now we can write our KCL equation at node three. So that's going to be this current, this current, and this current added together. So what's the current flowing to the left through the J12 ohm impedance going to be? Yeah. Yep, V3 minus V2 over J12. Absolutely right. Thank you. 
the world is looking at that thing. Or we're going away. And yet, so we're going away. Yeah, we're looking by the future. So when we stay able, you know, we see why we want to wait. Stay on. That's exactly what we had right here when we were doing KCL at node two. Yeah. But now we're doing KCL at node three. So we just took care of this guy right here. So what's the current flowing down through the current source going to be? It's not a resistor or it's not an impedance. It's a current source. So it, the current is a known quantity. We don't need to do anything to it. We just have to make sure that our sign is correct, right? So we're trying to find the current down. The current source is flowing up. So it's just negative 0 0.2 angle zero degrees. And then now we have the current flowing to the right through the 10 ohm resistor. What's that going to be? B3 minus zero over 10. Now we have our three equations for our three unknowns. So we could solve that system using MathCAD. Uh, I'm going to let you guys try to tackle that. So before we close things out here, ultimately we're asked to solve for the voltage VY. Once we know our nodal voltages, how are we going to get VY? So it's a voltage relationship equation, just like the first one that we wrote. What's the nodal voltage at the positive polarity terminal of VY? What's the nodal voltage at the positive polarity terminal, right? So our positive polarity terminal is on that node. What nodal voltage is for that node? V3. What's the nodal voltage at the negative polarity terminal? Ground, which is zero. So Vy is literally just zero. All right, so you can do this one in MathCAD very similarly to how we did the first problem. Um, so like I said, I want you guys to get some practice doing it. So take a stab at it. If you have any questions or anything, I would be more than happy to help to sort what's what. Nick, what's up? So I'm going to go on the same. All right. Uh, I'm going to that. Yes, try to change it. 
Yeah, so yeah. Which is now the So D1 is one X zero degrees. D2 is one X zero degrees. Is it okay if I just like see I want to do I agree? Like essentially, I would prefer if you did it on a separate sheet and then the whole thing. So, like, I mean, Put yourself a new tall down here. Um, so this, this is the same. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we had Well, they're not yet on the people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. Um, do I do want to the you got to have an operator. Oh, oh, oh that is oh. Oh, the only one is one. Like, this is what we play around with. Okay, so I'm going to see. Okay. So I hope I could have Um, for what it's worth, I, I think I forgot to hand these out. Oh, someone was already. How many of you guys? No, 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 so, 
No, yeah, it gives you the I 
Well, they are. There are some. All right, now we've got one. Now the three of us have the same answer. Not that one. Oh, that one. Well, we only got like 12, 30. <laughs> 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 I was like, Awesome. Thank you so much. I understand. 
Set mesh analysis because this one flows like this, so I can do super mesh for like 33 style. But... So, uh, may I borrow your pencil here? Yeah. You would do one around here, one around here, and one around here. Uh, so, okay. there's your three meshes. These are going to be super meshes because that current source is in the middle. Yeah, and so, like, if this was I1 and this guy right here was I2. You would say that two angle zero degrees is equal to I2 minus I1 for this one. If we made this guy right here I3, and then this guy here I4, this guy down here I5, okay. we would have four angle zero is I4 minus I5. Okay, so, so we're going to wind up with five equations, those three KBL equations, and then those two current relationship equations. Okay. That's a lot simpler than my idea because I thought meshes were just individual squares, not the row. They are. Oh. But okay. so we're doing a super mesh to avoid that current source. Okay. So you're 100% correct that the mesh is just the individual square. We're doing the super mesh because there's no way to take to know the voltage drop across that current source. So we're avoiding it and using a different relationship. I mean, I did that personally. Yeah, I did that. Yeah, I did that. Yeah, well, like, I, like, that's one reason why I really want my job. Like, I'll be talking so that I can just, like, um, yeah, be convincing him to spend that to be Give me an iPhone. iPhone. Um, Zach's going to cross courses from plotting in Python so that we can understand compute better um, for 270 because I don't. I spent $100. Wait, is there a class in here after after this? Yes, I think so. Somebody go check the schedule. I'm ninety percent sure that there's a class in here because the only class that I have in here is on Tuesday, Thursday, and there's usually people outside 
waiting to get in when I'm leaving. Okay. Well, we're just curious because we're, I, I'm looking for a classroom. We can give them a craft the application on Python for like 279. Writing and note taking. Yeah, is Mr. Deal taking the test with those two? That's up to him. <laughs> um, PDF annotator. And then I just, um, I have a sheet, uh, like an engineering pad effectively that I made just by making copies of that thing yeah. because I can't do math and not on engineering. Top. Yeah. Because I've been using OneNote. I hate OneNote so much because it doesn't have pages. Yeah, it's kind of just like they get cut off about here. Yeah, I, I that bothers me. So I just made my own thing that worked. And then I've started having an issue with OneNote where like, you know, like whenever you draw it, it writes the line as you draw it. Mm -hmm. I've, it has always done that until about like halfway through last quarter. It just like completes, it shows you the line once you pull the pin off. And if you draw too long of a line, it crashes one note. Oh goodness, that's yeah, that's really not good. So looking for something else. Yeah. Yeah. I like this program a lot. Um, but yeah, when I, yeah, so when I bought it, you were you were just able to buy it. Now I think it's on some asinine subscription model or something like that, which annoys the shit out of me. They just found some download for it somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I was gonna or would something. You recommend I could, uh, get the calculator that you would recommend this class. Online. Anywhere that sells calculators. All right. Yeah. They, I, didn't, I didn't know. They haven't met Office Depot. Yeah. Okay. Not, not, yeah. uh, not eBay, just in case yeah. you get a good one, which yeah. literally happens way more often than you would think. I mean, everyone's trying to scan college students. Yeah. I mean, it's a college student. Yeah. We're idiots. <laughs> but no, I, yeah, because I, I didn't have one for the homework. I had found a website that was able to do it, but yeah. I definitely need one for they for sure have the, the white version of that one. I don't, I don't know what the number the yeah. That. So the white version of this is a hot commodity because it's discontinued, but it is a quite a good calculator. Okay, and if you buy it off of eBay and you get it for less than $50, it's a thing. Yeah, no, I'm going to be trying to get one before. We can use calculators for the test. Right? Mm -hmm, okay, yeah, I'm definitely going to try to get one before the next the first test. Or, yeah, that, that would be a very good plan. Later. So, <laughs> <laughs> I have never been to school test time, session session in my life. And I left with like four minutes left and my hand was like, I can do this. Like, I was like, what? I don't know if you the You have a le less understanding of the math, yeah. yeah. What the hell? I wish there was a way to make that stupid thing for Zoom smaller so that it stopped getting in my damn way all the time.
this big black bar that gets in the way when I'm using other programs. Oh, so, the, the, uh, uh, maybe this thing that says hide floating meeting controls. I'll be damned. <laughs> Okay. I'm annoyed that it's taken me, I think, four years to find that. Yeah. 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 No problem. See you on Tuesday.